We are uh, today with uh, Professor Dina Porat, head of the Cantor Center uh, from the Tel Aviv University, chief historian of Yad Vashem since 2010, um, a mayor, a professor, teacher, um, uh, investigator of the Shoah on the, of anti-Semitism, a, a very recognized uh, character in, in Israel in uh, the intellectual circles. Uh, on February 2018, uh, she was, I assisted uh, and shared our staying in uh, Vienna uh, on uh, a meeting um, with the theme, analyzing the theme, an end to anti-Semitism. And uh, she was one of the organizers of this meeting. So first and foremost, uh, this recording it takes place on Thursday, the May the 13th. So I must begin my dear Dina, expressing to you my deep concerns and solidarity with you, with the whole population of Israel, the whole population of, uh, which is suffering now from this uh, terrible and dramatic uh, uh, war. Uh, and riots and violence, our heart is uh, with you. So, thank you. First, the first question uh, Why did you choose uh, the Shoah as a main theme in your research? Ah. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you for expressing this solidarity. We do hope matters will calm down soon um, and we will go on as uh, before. Uh, why have I chosen not only uh, uh, the Holocaust but anti-Semitism as well uh, as a, a main theme, well, theme it's uh, the Holocaust uh, researching the Holocaust is like diving into an ocean. Um, there were some two, three reasons. Uh, one of them that indeed I was born in Buenos Aires and someone wrote in black big tar letters on the building we were living in, uh, Mate Judios, kill Jews. And when I was able more or less to begin reading, I saw what it is I didn't understand. And I came to my father to ask him, Tatanyu, what is it? And he said, he told me what it is, though I was barely six, six and a half. And he said, remember always, those who wrote it and those who will speak like this they are on the wrong side and you are on the right one. Remember it. And I always remembered it. And also he, my father, um, uh, was a member of the presidency of the World Jewish Congress, representing Latin America for many years. And he accumulated in his library a lot of the publications that were published during World War II, the Holocaust, and after. And I got this library later. So I, I had a beginning at home. It was an open home. And refugees came from Europe. They slept and ate in our open home. They sang the partisan songs and other songs. And it was very much at, at home as a, a major experience. Then I grew up in Israel. I went to elementary school, to high school, to the army, etc. And when I study, started studying Jewish history in the Department of Jewish History in Tel Aviv University, I realized it was the mid 60s, 1960s, 
that no one is teaching the Holocaust, no one. We were all, all my other colleagues were into researching, reading, writing Zionism. That's it. Zionism, the land of Israel, how it came about, uh, the war of independence, etc., etc. But no one, and I'm speaking about 1965, taught the Holocaust. Not in the universities, not in high school. And I came from a home, as I told you, where I, I was sure and aware that this is a major, major experience in the life of the Jewish people. And it is not being, uh, it is hardly being mentioned. Moreover, when I came to the head of the department and said, I would like to study about the Holocaust. He said, okay, you prepare your own curricula and your own list of books, and we will examine you on that. But please remember, that studying this issue, you may go mad, I warn you. This was the attitude in Israel in the 1960s. Only then, Professor Uriel Tal came from uh, Jerusalem, the Hebrew University, to teach us about the Nazi ideology and organization. Professor Karpi about Italy and about uh, the Jewish councils, etc. Only then it began, but I was almost alone uh, as, um, as one who wanted to go on with MA and PhD. Only later it developed and um, the Holocaust from the 1970s was taught in high schools, in universities, a lot of research following the Eichmann trial and later. Uh, and this is how I started. And then when everyone was into Holocaust, I took a side and went to antisemitism. And in the 1980s, 1990s, I began researching antisemitism and again, the same thing. In the Department of General History, they said antisemitism. What kind of an issue is this for research? Every Jew can tell you what antisemitism is. But I said, got in you in Himmel. Every chupchik on the moon is worthy on research and antisemitism 2000 years old is not. And I began and I carried on. And of course they admitted later that um, it is an issue and a central issue. And this is how I now go on in the two of them. What are, if they are, Yes. The major themes on uh, your uh, research field uh, on uh, nowadays, the, the, what are the most important themes that, uh, uh, that are being uh, researching in, in our days? Okay. Yeah, on the field, of course, on the field of the Shoah and anti-Semitism. Uh, okay. the, main, the main issues. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the question. Um, there are a number of issues which at, I started with dealing with long ago, but they are still relevant because you are speaking about today and I go on with them and I will mention three. Uh, one of them is that I started researching the Holocaust in Lithuania because Lithuania was the first place where the, the Wehrmacht, the German army invaded on June 1941. And in a month in June, we will mention 80 years to this event, to this invasion. And this is where the systematic killing started. Not in the extermination camps yet, but in shooting into pits and valleys. And I wanted to find out how did it start, what was the role of the local population, and it was a very central role of the local population. The Lithuanians killed most of the Jews of Lithuania, sometimes before, without any German in the village or in the shtetl. How was it done? 
how did they transfer from killing men only to killing uh, children and women? Where did it take them on? Uh, and this was my first uh, research, or, or one of my first research, definitely. And um, it is relevant today, because today in Lithuania, as in many other Eastern countries, they are trying to change the history and rewrite it. And now they are writing another narrative in the government in Poland, in Lithuania, in Slovakia, in Hungary, in the Ukraine, they are imposing a different narrative according to which they were victims. They were victims of the Germans and they were victims of the Germans. But at the same time, they helped the Germans turn the Jews into victims. It's not that they, they and the Jews stood, stood together against uh, uh, the Germans. And so today, knowing the history of Lithuania and of the other countries during World War II in the Holocaust is very relevant in the atmosphere of today. Uh, a second issue, a second issue is the church. Um, and uh, here, uh, I must tell you that I, again, uh, I was, deeply surprised to realize that my students, I started with it in the 19, late 1980s, 1990s, my students in Tel Aviv University, very excellent students, did not know a first thing about the Catholic Church, about uh, habits and traditions and popes and uh, beliefs. It was, I don't have to tell you, the Catholic Church has been accused by the Jewish people for forming the negative image of Jews along centuries. They didn't kill the Jews. They even sometimes the Pope helped protect them, but they created the image that later was a foundation, a background for the Holocaust because in many countries, the beliefs were the Jews killed Jesus, that they use the blood for Pes of children for Pesach, that they violate the, the bread, the sacred bread, et cetera, et cetera. So the image was there and the Catholic church was suspected. And by many Jews, I can tell you, sorry to say so, is still suspected. And so I started teaching and researching the changes that the Catholic Church is undergoing following the Holocaust. From, I, I wrote quite a research on Roncalli, Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, who later became Pope uh, John XXIII. He was at the war stationed in Istanbul. He met delegates from the land of Israel and he helped them as much as he could. A warm and open personality. Had he been the Pope, perhaps our lives would have been uh, later if had he been the Pope during the Holocaust. So I found an archive that deals with his activities. I wrote about it. I was invited twice to the Vatican to speak about him. And I started translating the documents that the Vatican issued from 1965, the Nostra Etate, which Nostra Etate in our time, when there was quite a revolution in the life of the Catholic Church, including its attitude towards Jews. The Jews were absolved of the crucifixion of Christ. They were still declared the chosen people together with the Christians and antisemitism was denounced in any way, every and any way. And I translated into Hebrew all the documents, 1965 and then 1978, et cetera, et cetera, a long line of documents, speeches that popes held in Yad Vashem, in Auschwitz. The whole attitude changed. It suddenly was a friendly, open, looking for a dialogue attitude. The students couldn't believe it. 
and I translated it in the book, published in the book, and the book was quite successful. People didn't know. So this is another issue that I think should go on and it is going on with the present Pope Francis, who kindly wrote in December 2015, a long, excellent document saying that a Christian cannot be an anti-Semite. So I go on with this too, because there is still a lot to do in this regard. And then anti-Semitism, today's anti-Semitism, contemporary one. What is going on today? Why is it going on today? Where are the main points geographically, ideologically, where it flourishes? And here, I don't have to tell you, there is even more work to do. And this is the third issue I'm dealing with. Um, thanks. Um, I would like to add the, um, a footnote, I, I would say, to your words. Um, I found a, a great parallel between your life uh, story and my life story because uh, I and my childhood also received uh, a lot of testimonies from the Shoah, many people who uh, survived the Shoah visited us and told us, and I was present uh, because in our generation in Argentina, uh, the, the kids, the kids, let us yeah. say, uh, say the proper word, uh, were present. Uh, hearing, uh, paying attention to those terrible testimonies. I, I cannot forget and I will not forget uh, the expression of the eyes, what, what the expression of the faces, especially the eyes without, uh, without light mm. of uh, many of the people that I uh, met in my house, uh, uh, who survived the Shoah. And uh, okay, let us go now to, to I, I have more two questions. I, I have a short question. Uh, do you have some special expectations regarding uh, the opening of the, of the archives of the Vatican? Uh, you know, this is a, uh, this is a theme which um, it's very close to me because when we um, prepared the book uh, on heaven and earth uh, and we analyzed the Shoah and the chapter of the Shoah, so I, we spoke really with an absolutely open heart, uh, each with the other, and without any barriers. The only one barrier was to express all the things in a, respect, in a respectful way to the other. And I told them, uh, look, to, to the then Cardinal of Buenos Aires, Bergoglio, uh, current Pope Francis, I told him, look, really I cannot understand the silence uh, of Pius XII, because uh, maybe, according to certain historians, that he, uh, through his silence, uh, saved a lot of Jews. But through his silence, this is my understanding, he condemned a lot of Jews to death. Uh, and from a biblical point of view, which the word is so important, which in the, 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 the books of the prophets, we read a lot about the, uh, the power of the, of the word or uh, the commandment that God says to the prophets, go to the people of Israel and say, and exclaim, and say this message, other message, with all the prophets, not only with with Moses. So what he said, his answer was, uh, we have to open the archives, the archives and try to find the, the truth. This was the, and when he opened the archives, really, um, I felt very, very close to him. Uh, and uh, in my heart, I recognized him a lot. And I saw the, 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 the loyalty, uh, our common loyalty, the loyalty between us, the loyalty that bonds us uh, together. He fulfilled what he said. 
So do you have some expectation? It, it, there is a place to have some expectation to find out something that could enlighten the, the, a little bit about Pius XII. Well, um, once the, the problem was, the, unfortunately, that once the um, archives were open, the corona came and they were immediately closed back. There were just one or two or a few, perhaps, I don't know, and there were more scholars who already went to the Vatican and one of them already published that uh, the Pope knew much more than we had known, etc. I thought that this was too early and they took week to pass such a decisive verdict uh, before you have to see it for months and to read and to really research and to juxtapose documents and knowledge that you have from other archives and only then speak. But indeed, I think the main issues that we hope to find an answer to are the explanations to the behavior of Pope Pius XII and the question of his arguments. What were the arguments behind his silence? Uh, was it the fear of communism? Was it the fear of being conquered by Germany? Was it a fear that Germany will go even more violently against Catholic priests in other countries, etc.? So we would like, if possible, if there is something written about it, of course. Uh, and then uh, indeed the question of when did the information about the Holocaust reach him? Did it reach him in real time? Did it reach him late? To verify this very decisive point as well. And I would also like personally to find in the archives, when did the protocols of Auschwitz reach the Vatican? And why is that? Because I know for a fact from the archive I told you about, where there is a copy of the protocols of Auschwitz, that Roncalli, Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, uh, who was then a, de a delegate, not a nuncio, but a delegate of the Pope in Istanbul, got them from the delegates from the land of Israel and he wired them immediately to the Pope on the day he got them. He read it, I don't think he read it, it was read to him because it was in German and they communicated in French but it was translated to him, he cried, he cried at hearing that millions, so many people are being killed there and how and he wired it immediately to the Pope and a day after the Pope, the King of Sweden, the Red Cross and President Roosevelt warned Hungary to stop the deportations of the Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz. But later the Vatican said that they got the protocols only in October. And that was June. That was the middle of June, June 1944, when the trains were running from Hungary to Auschwitz. I would very much like to find out when indeed did they get it and how did they, how did it affect the decision of the Pope to go out and ask for the stopping of the deportations. So these are my expectations from the archives. Um, a question uh, or two questions in one. Uh, the theme of the Shoah will have, uh, this is my, uh, my way of, of seeing the theme of the Shoah, of understanding the Shoah, that this theme will have a message from now onwards, from midor uh, ledor, from generation to generation. Okay. What is the message for the, of the Shoah for the world of today and the the second part of the question, how uh, can we transmit really this message to the new generations? Mm. Okay, uh, so what and how? Indeed, there are two, uh, two questions here. 
uh, regarding the what, <clears throat> I would say that uh, first of all, the main lesson, a main lesson from the Holocaust is that it happened, which means that such uh, a, such a crime, such cruelty was possible, was possible. And if it was, if this were possible once, I think one should study and study it and study what, how it happened, what are its unique characteristics in order to try to tackle today's atrocities and mass murders. Because after World War II, there was such hope and establishment of international tools like the UN, like the, <clears throat> uh, like the decisive paper against genocide in 1948, the Convention Against Genocide, 1948, and then the Declaration of Human Rights, 1942. There are tools, but still you had Rwanda and you had Darfur and you had Cambodia and now you have Kenya and you had Yugoslavia. So <clears throat> I think those who study the Holocaust should do more, more in order to make it a warning, to make it a warning against other mass murders that are not on the scale of the Holocaust and perhaps cannot be compared to it, or they cannot be equated to it, but they can be compared. And one should do a lot more. Also, <laughs> I think um, in a way of a message, it's not only a message of what they did to us, the Jewish people, not to concentrate, to know and research and study definitely what they did to us, but to take it as a starting point for teaching broadly about human rights, democracy, rights of minorities, other minorities, other sufferings, so that the Holocaust would serve, not just for the history of the Jewish people, but for future, for future teaching and enlightenment of the next generations of what happens when you forget or violate human rights, rights of minorities, democracy, values, accepting the other, etc. I think it has here, the study of the Holocaust and the teaching of it has a double message about the Jewish people, but from it teaching broadly and openly and un universally. You know that, um, of course you know, that uh, Holocaust, International Holocaust Memorial Day happens on January 27, the day of the liberation of Auschwitz. And on that day, the Israeli foreign ministry sends lecturers abroad. And some of us, Yad Vashem people mainly, we were sent to Africa, to African countries. And there you could see, for instance, that in South Africa, they say, ha, huh, the Nuremberg, the, the apartheid laws that we had, these are the Nuremberg laws. In Senegal, they showed the place, um, uh, a certain um, um, a, a, a kind of a build, big building from which, a fortress rather, from which the, the future slaves were sent to the United States from Africa. And they said, look, this is our Umschlagplatz, the place from which in Warsaw and in other ghettos, the people, the, the Jews were, were deported. So you have, and in Rwanda, I wrote a book recently about revenge and about the wish of Jews to revenge on the Germans. And it raises a lot of questions. And I lectured in Rwanda. And in Rwanda, they said, uh, of course, we have the same problems. Do you forgive? Do you forget? How do you punish? How long will you punish? So you can take the Holocaust and from it start 
connections with other tragedies and with the basic knowledge of democracy and values. Now, the second part of your question was how? And this is a big question, especially since now the survivors are most of them, uh, we have only uh, one half of this original number of survivors, but we don't, we don't have a half from Europe. We have a, a third from Europe, a third from uh, the uh, um, Soviet Union, and a third from North Africa. So these are different experiences of being a survivor. But the original ones are passing away. Those from the Soviet Union are also passing away. And so the question is, what would you do when they are not here anymore to tell the stories? So the question of how is very important. And I think that right now, new technologies must be employed and implemented in order to go on telling the story. And I will give you an example. There is today Google and Facebook and Instagram and whatever. Now on Instagram, there was no, two years ago, um, they took, the producers took a diary of a young girl in Hungary, the diary of Eva, and they, um, commemorated it like, they produced it like a play with all the costumes of the time and the furniture of the time and with the text of the diary on Instagram. And before it was on, before it was aired, I was interviewed on the radio or TV and they said, ah, Instagram, this is cheapening the Holocaust. This will ruin, uh, this is so vulgar, etc. I said, no, how do you know it's vulgar? I haven't seen it yet. So what if, if it's on Instagram? The children, most of the children who will see the Instagram will not read the book. You reach many, many more young generations. And indeed, and they said, it's not the tool that is important, but the respect and the contents. And indeed, a million and a half immediately saw it on that very day, Holocaust Memorial Day, and then many more other millions. So I think that with new technology and with openness to media channels that the young generation is using, even this TikTok, that is so problematic, but if you take it and through it, you reach youngsters respectful with respect to them and to the Holocaust, I think you can do a lot. You know that in Yad Vashem, they developed a means for you to ask questions of a survivor who is not alive anymore and he answers you. How does he answer you if he's not alive anymore? They took testimonies, okay? A testimony of the survivors that you want to ask, and it is recorded and videoed, video filmed, and you ask a question and they give you the answer from his testimony. So you have a conversation with a survivor who is not living anymore. So uh, I think there will be the technical new means and we will have to go on without the survivors with the museums with the testimonies the books the exhibitions whatever we have and reach the younger generations by new technologies yeah uh, spielberg foundation uh, did a lot on this theme uh, taking uh, the te living test recording living testimonies from uh, for many many survivors, Dina, uh, I thank you a lot a lot for your time, and uh, much more than your time for uh, the great messages that you deliver to all of us, 
uh, the document, because uh, this recording is going to be a document for Graz College. Um, the, for being so inspiring for, uh, for many, many of us. Uh, the best for you and uh, our you. prayers, wishes, hopes that uh, the blessing which appears in the book of Psalms uh, and ends with the words Shalom al Israel will very, very soon, very soon be uh, the reality of uh, Medinat Israel and uh, all the neighbors around uh, it. Amen. The, best, Amen. the best for you and thanks Thank a you. lot again. We remember. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Bye bye. Toda.